Hello, my name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. Our continuing series in History 102 from 1500 to 2000, the Industrial Revolution, Pollution, Romance, Money, Communism, and Fozzywig. Industrialization in this period we're going to talk about from 1750 to 1900 is the replacement of muscle power with machine power. It starts in Britain, in Great Britain, and part of the reason why was the need to produce more stuff despite less people. The Napoleonic Wars. Britain should not have won the Napoleonic Wars. It should have been overwhelmed by the sheer size of the French Revolutionary Elan, of their, of their armies, of their navy. It should have been overwhelmed. Britain wasn't a big populated place. It wasn't particularly wealthy compared to revolutionary France. And yet it wins. And one of the ways it wins is the earliest parts of industrialization. The idea that you didn't need more people to make more stuff. That a machine could make more stuff with less people. Now to do that, the machine needs energy. The machine needs power. And it turns out Britain has an abundance of it, especially coal. Now, we'll talk about the effects of that later, but in the beginning, Britain has it. It has the ingredients for industrialization. And it now, with the Napoleonic Wars, has a reason to invest in it. The U.S. has the Civil War and has rapid industry industrialization with that and then afterwards. But the major part of uh, U.S. industrialization was immigration. Massive in immigration from Europe, which allowed for cheap labor and a large customer base at the same time. So it allowed for factories to constantly open up, but also created a customer base that was large enough that you didn't have to export in order to make money. You could sell domestically. The rest of the world that are going to in has to catch up that are going to industrialize. Now, most of the world can't. So the rest is like France, Germany, Italy, Japan, and they'll get wealthy and they will leave the non-industrialized world behind. Why? Why are they leaving the non-industrial world behind? Because the first effect is a massive increase in production. Industrialization is the biggest event in the history of humanity since agriculture. If you are watching the video, you can see where industrialization happens. All the lines on gross domestic product, gross domestic GDP per capita, that means production of goods per person, just skyrockets after 1800. Productivity, boom. From 1800, you can see where industrialization is happening. It goes from a fairly flat line to suddenly 45 degree angles. <laughs> So that in 1800, it, the, by, between 1810 and 1870, the rate goes up somewhere like six times, sixfold, 600% increase. Like there is nothing else in human activity other than learning to farm that has this big of an effect on human production of stuff and, their, and consequently their livelihood. So... The industrialized world, which today is about 30 countries or so, leaves the non-industrial world behind. And this is where we'll get into Darwinism and scientific racism and, and um, uh, social Darwinism. The idea that white people really are better than everyone else. In 1500, white people had power, but they couldn't conquer Africa. It was too, too, the tropical diseases killed white people who went into it. And so they couldn't go there. There were limitations on European power. By 1900, there is no limitation on European power in the world. Between science and production and industrialization, Europeans will simply outproduce the limitations of nature. Two, you have a decrease in the cost of goods and an increase in availability. It is more stuff and easier to get. All that leads to better living. Why? Because in the because you're producing so much, you can sell things at 
less profit per item, which means more people can afford to buy that stuff for the first time. There's a very famous photo series that I like a lot in which the photographer takes wide angle photos of supermarket shelves. And it's all of this stuff and it's all brightly colored and it's all, it's supposed to get into marketing and consumerism and advertising. But from a historian point of view, like a supermarket is an insane concept because it can only exist in a world of industrialization. I go to Wegmans and there's six kinds of balsamic vinegar and another five or six kinds of flavored balsamic vinegar, fig and orange and, and, and lemon. And like, why does a store need 10 balsamic vinegars? Why not just have one and maybe one flavor? Why have 10? Now that makes my life better because by having 10, I have more choice, but also by having 10, they're all competing with each other. So the price that they're going to sell at the increase in the profit is going to be less. So that bottle of balsamic vinegar that might last me a couple of months is five bucks. Well, five bucks per day is almost nothing. That's what industrialization can do. Third, completely changes where people live with urbanization. People now where for farming, you had to live in the countryside. You had to live in the rural world to stay away from people. So you had the land in order to farm. Now you have to live together. Massive growth of cities as people come to work. Cities equal concentration of workers and buyers. Cities also equal transportation hubs to sell exports. London triples in size in 100 years. It took 1,800 years for London to get to 2 million people. And then 100 years to get to 6 million people. That's insane. That's an insane rate of growth. But what it allowed for was an a growth in economics for an efficient concentration of scale. The more people, the more efficient the buying and selling and producing of goods is. It allows for scale. Whereas in the countryside, people are spread out. It's harder to get them all together to work. It's harder to sell stuff to individuals. This is why you had the door to door salesman after the depression or during the depression and they would go out to the rural countryside like in theory it could work in the cities but in the cities you could go to a store it's more maybe more convenient to have someone come to your house to sell you encyclopedias or or a vacuum but in the rural countryside where you might be 30 miles away from town or more it was necessary for someone to come and knock on your door and be like, I have stuff. Do you want any of it? Because the countryside, the rural countryside is not efficient for an economy of scale, whereas cities are. All of this is a success, a stunning success. You live in this success. Income for educated workers, skilled labor. That's what we're going to call educated workers at this point increases. And they become what we can legitimately start to call a middle class. They are a group of people who make money by using their brain instead of their body. Now, that's going to have an effect. What are the middle classes? Well, they are people who no longer feel that they are part of the working poor, the working classes. They're above that. They make more money than that. But they're not independent either. They still work for the rich. So they can see the law. They know they don't want to be poor. They used to be poor and they look at the poor and go, I don't want to be that. And they work for the rich and they see the lives of the rich, but they're also locked out of that too. And thus we call them the middle class. But here's the thing, and you need to asterisk this. You need to put this up. This is a footnote. The middle classes are still poor. Like most of you, if you're in my class, in my community college class, I almost guarantee that you're poor. You are a poor person in my class. 
and I'll get students and you may be like, I'm not poor. Yeah. Think about what would happen if you lost your income, you lost your job, you lost your income. Can you calculate how quickly your bank account, your savings account will go to zero? If the answer to that is yes, you're poor. If you can calculate in your head how quickly you'll be penniless, homeless, destitute, you're poor. So middle class, and this is very, very important because the middle class does not want to be poor. It is terrified of being poor. And this is going to affect a lot of politics between now and the Depression and, and 1900. Like, we live in a world where the middle classes are terrified of poverty because they haven't received a raise since 1973. In the United States, the average income, once you figure out for inflation, hasn't really increased since 1973. But for the rich, the top 1% to 2%, people who don't care about money, and that's the thing. Rich people are both obsessed with money and don't care about it. Why? Because money is like water. They never run out of it. They live in it. So it doesn't matter. And yet it very much matters because it's the, it's the uh, centerpiece of their identity. Unless they're old school rich. What in New England we call the blue bloods. Because they will never, they don't even know how much money they have. They will never run out of money. Money is not no longer water, it's air. It's a thing that exists, but you do not see. You do not know. The new rich, the nouveau riche. Hey, 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 I'm a, I, I, I won the star, I won the, uh, the lotto, or I won, or I'm, a, I'm on a, a, a tech stock, right? I'm a programmer, and I, my, my tech stock you know, tech company sold for $20 million. Those people, those people were poor and now they're rich and they could go back to being poor, I suppose. But for them, they could be obsessed with money because they're obsessed because they didn't have it and now they have it and now they're comparing it to other people. I've never seen people who are more jealous than the people in the two to about eight million dollar category, and you know who they're ca they're jealous of the people with twenty five and fifty million dollars. They don't even think about us, and I do well. I do well as a college professor. I work hard, but I do well. But I am still a public employee, and so I am not reeling in. You know, I make an upper middle class income. But I can calculate when I draw out of money. And it wouldn't be that far. You know, because you have your mortgage, you have your kids, you have your medicine, you have your this, your that, your the, the other thing. Your car, your gas, food. You can run out of it pretty quick. So this is very important. I know I'm taking a little bit of time on this part. But the middle classes begin to think that they're not poor. And we don't call them poor. We call them middle classes. And you go, ha ha. And everybody in America is middle class. People from around $30,000 to $250,000 identify themselves as middle class. Neither of that is true. The middle is 45 to about 65,000. There's your middle. 250,000 is in the like top 5%. And 20,000 is poverty. So if you're at 30,000, you're, you're much closer to poverty than the middle. And so middle class becomes an identity. I am not poor. But in this class, in reality, you are poor because you are entirely dependent on that income. But it will have he that identity changing, that lack of of class identity class solidarity if you're a bernie fan you know exactly what i'm talking about and if you've ever read das kapital or anything by marx you know what i'm talking about the idea that the middle classes are like i'm not poor so i don't have to i don't need 
stuff. Or they shouldn't get stuff. They should pull themselves up by their, 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 their britches just like I did. It's very important that the middle classes don't like the poor. And it starts with they don't live with them. They got out. Two, GDP and income equal more cultural creation, more education, more leisure time, more sports. Life gets better and there's more things to do with your time. You get more time. This is one of the fallacies of rich people work harder. No, they don't. They work less. The first thing you do when you make more money is work less. That's what you do. I mean, think about if you won $100 million in the, in the lotto. What would you do? Work more? No. You'd immediately more work less. You'd immediately go into Applebee's and say, yeah, I'm quit. I'm done. You wouldn't say, I'm going to run a $100 million foundation and work at Applebee's because, you know, I need to make more income. No, you'd say, I'm making 8 to 10% on the stock market on my $100 million. I'm fine with that. Thank you. Moving on. Three, city life is exciting. It's anonymous. We got shows like Sex in the City and we got Marilyn Tyler Moore in Minneapolis. She made Mar Minneapolis in 1970 look sexy. Minneapolis. It, she didn't have to go to New York City or LA. And the city is anonymous. It's exciting. You can start over. It is so much different from small farm life in whether it's America or the Midlands of, of England. We get the Horatio Alger story. Anybody can make it. It's C. Dick Whittington. Whittington. Dick Whittington is a story of, um, now that's a medieval story, about uh, a young boy who comes to London and goes from nothing to being Lord Mayor. Right? One of the richest men. He started, <coughs> he's a real person. He was really Lord Mayor. And he made enough money that he created a foundation that still 700 years later. This is why people who, when I have students, if here's the thing. If you think rich people can run out of money, you're poor. Because you can't. If you ever really want to see how this works, watch Brewster's Millions back in the 80s. Dick Winnington's foundation is still operating on money, on its original principle, 700 years later. Think about that. That money he put aside is still working. It's still making more money. That's how compact compound interest goes. And Dick Winnington becomes the main character. He becomes the surname for the main character in Mad Men. Dick Whitman. The idea that you can go and go to New York and remake your life. That's in Hamilton, right? In New York, you can be a new man. You know, the first song in Hamilton is about leaving Nevis. It's leaving St. Kitts. It's leaving the middle of nowhere. This rock in the Caribbean. And coming to New York, where you can be a new man. In New York, you can be a new man. Right? Max Weber, the Protestant work ethic. Working hard will make you more money. Now, you who work in minimum wage jobs, you who are waitresses, you who are childcare, you know that's not true. But this is the Protestant philosophy. He's trying, Max Weber is trying to understand why Northern Europe, the German states, Scandinavia, England, are wealthier than the more rural, Catholic, hotter, Southern European states. Why is that? And the thing he centered on was the Protestantism. He said, ah, in Protestantism, you don't have the Catholic Church holding you down. So you have the Protestant work ethic. In Catholicism, you have all those saint days giving you time off. In Protestantism, you, can, you have to work. And if you work, you can get rich. Working hard makes you more money. The opposite of the Protestant work ethic, and you know this because you've heard this in America, is... If you're poor, you must be lazy. If you're on welfare, you must be lazy. If you're poor, you don't work hard. I don't know, man. I've known hustlers. I've taught in Candom for nearly 15 years now. I've known all kinds of people. I've known wealthy people from Haddonfield and Moorestown. And I know people who don't have glass in their window frames in Camden and people 
like that in in Gloucester County, in the white people in you know, um, some of the townships in Gloucester County who don't have a roof. The roof is falling down on them. And those poor dudes work two, three, four jobs. They just work at them for seven bucks, ten bucks an hour. Dude, do you know how hard a drug dealer works? You got to be out on the corner. You got to hustle. You got people who might kill you. You got to watch for the cops. You got, you know, idiotic, dumb white dudes from the suburbs coming in who don't know how to buy anything. You know, wanting to negotiate prices. Like, you don't have time for that. And you got to be out there rain or shine. And dude, there's somebody else who wants that corner, even if they're in your own crew. So you got to, you, dude. And then you're going to go to school? And get a degree? Like, dude. Like, I am not part of those worlds. I am an upper middle class white dude. But I've met enough people in my 15 years down here in Philly that I know they work hard. I know they work hard. So it's not the hard work. But Max Weber gives this idea that if you work, you can make more money. Now, he's not an economist. He's a sociologist. And so he's trying to find out why Northern Europe is different. And that's what he came up with. And it becomes f pretty famous. And it's taking modern economics to be like, no, it doesn't work that way. It's all these other factors. So what are some of the problems of the Industrial Revolution? First is <laughs> the, the rich had money for education, which allowed the rich to have a monopoly on the best jobs because they could send their kids to university. And university isn't about education. This is the thing. If you think going to Harvard gets you a better education, you're poor. University is about networking. It's about meeting people. Facebook is invented at Harvard, but it's also funded by students at Harvard. That's the more important part. Zuckerberg meets the people who will help him create Facebook at Harvard. It's the networking. My History 101 is as good as anyone else's History 101. In any, on the entire, you no matter what college, no matter what you pay, my History 101 is the same information with better cultural references than most of the schools that you would attend. So don't think just because it's a wealthier school, it's, a, it's an Ivy League school, it's a better education. It's not. The, your education is how, what you make of it. So I highly recommend you go and use your professors. Go to their office hours. Ask them. They're professionals. They are. There is nobody in this country who knows more about Swedish military history than me in the 15, 1600s. There is not. I know because I'm the only one who presents papers on them at conferences. There's me and another dude over in San Francisco and we we were always on the same panels. He does the 1620s, I do the 1650s. Hey, Joe, good to see what you're working on. You know, I lo love running. We go and we're the only two who work on it. So we go and get lunch and we get dinner on the first day. And it's nice. But if you want to be a Scandinavian military historian in the United States, you'd want to hang out in my office hours and be like, hey, can I talk to you? You know, otherwise you got to go to Sweden of where there are people who know more than me, without a doubt. So, but only the rich had access to this stuff. And education created the middle class jobs. So poor folk have to sacrifice or go into debt, I think you understand what I'm talking about, for access to that education which would get the middle class jobs. And that's where the separation from the middle class from the poor comes in. They start saying, we did it, I sacrificed, my father didn't have anything and he sent me to school. Or I didn't have anything and I worked two jobs and I went to school. Why are you still poor? So there's a resentment built into the middle classes that they're no longer poor. 
So why why do you get to be poor and then ask for stuff? And it's not fake. That's the important part. It is built on that sacrifice. Those of you who are taking out student loans now are going to have to spend decades paying them back. So this is the creation of a middle class, which are poor people who work with their brains for wealthy people. They're your managers, your clerks, your secretaries, your male secretaries to start with. It's not till the 1950s we get female secretaries, accountants, and those groups join the traditional middle classes of priests, officers, and professors. Notice priests, educated, literate, could read and write the Bible, right? Officers, educated, literate, needed to command people, troops, perfect managers, and professors who have to be smart enough to explain complicated stuff to not smart people. So those people were paid to use their brains. So that's your traditional middle classes. Now, you'll be like, well, what about doctors? Lawyers could be included in that too. There are, there are um, especially in Britain and Scandinavia, there are law professors as well. Law, lawyers can, can join that. Um, but you don't get doctors yet. And the reason you don't get doctors yet is medicine hasn't yet gotten there yet. Medicine doesn't become medicine at least until the invention of ether and really until penicillin. Your doctor is more likely to kill you in 1850 than they heal you and propose oh you know and he's more likely to kill you because he doesn't wash his hands because he doesn't know germs exist so he's putting his filthy hands into your body getting you sick medicine will become an upper middle class profession because it will rely it will catch up but notice what doctors do they take the word to call themselves they take teacher. Doctore means teacher. It's professor. So to make themselves more professional, they took the name from professors and they said, professors, you're not a doctor anymore. You're a professor and I'm a real doctor. And now I'll get people who are like, DR in front of your name. You're not a doctor. And I'm like, my my profession goes back 2,000 years. 2,000 years ago, they were still drilling heads into holes into people's heads to let out the spirits so you didn't have a headache. So let's, uh, you know, not talk about who's a real doctor. But they are middle class. Educated women could do these jobs, but they're regulated out of them. See Joe in Little Women, right? She wants to be a writer. She becomes an editor. And she could do that job. All, she, all you have to do is read and write and know your, your grammar rules. She could do that. Any woman could do that job if they had a certain educational um, experience. And it's only Joe. We, where are all the other women? Well, they're regulated out. They get married and they can't work. There, there are men doing the jobs. There's sexism. There's women could get the education and then have nothing to do with it. This will be Gloria Steinem's problem with no name is I have education and I have nothing to do with it. I can't do any jobs. I could do lots of jobs with my education. There's no jobs that will hire me to do them. So this is Bob Cratchit. This is Mr. Banks, who is very successful. He's, he's your 250,000. He's your, your upper crust of your, of your, of your upper middle class. There's Lizzie Bennett. There's the ladies and little women. They're all, none of them are are traditionally wealthy people. They're outside of wealth, but none of them are in poverty. The closest to being inside wealth is the Bennetts. But because they're all daughters, they're going to lose their property. They're going to lose the man, that man, the manor. It's not, it's tied to the male line. It's going to go to the, the pastor, the vicar cousin. And that's the big worry for Mrs. Bennett that all of her daughters will immediately become penniless when the husband dies. So their wealth, they are, they are liquid poor. They're cash poor. They're land big, but cash poor. Unskilled labor gets poor. Since machines do the labor, most of the work becomes watching the machines. Notice the skilled labor is watching the people. It's managers, right? Or it's watching the money the accountants. 
Unskilled labor is watching the machines and anyone can do that job. So unskilled labor wages crash as people compete with each other. This is the idea where you get people who are like, there shouldn't be a minimum wage. Well, then you'd have people working for less than a dollar an hour because poverty will force people to accept all kinds of wages. And that's not good for society. That impoverishes everybody. That's a whole nother problem. That's a whole nother thing. But that's why we'll have a minimum wage. To stop what happens next, pay declined from 23 shillings to six shillings between 1800 and 1830. It declined by almost fourfold. Declined, not increased. Remember, it increased for skilled labor, but it's declining for unskilled labor. As wages go down, women and children are forced to work for even lower wages. And what does that do? Suppress wages for all. Why do I have to pay you 23 shillings when I could pay your wife six shillings or your five-year-old kid six shillings or four shillings? What is the kid going to do? Negotiate? And so what you get is urban poverty, the ghettos, the slums, urban living, but with no services. They're crowded, diseased, there's crime. And the number one crime is thievery. We'll talk about that later. But because it's poor people living on top of other poor people who don't have money, they don't have stuff. Camden has high crime. Haddonfield has almost no crime. The average income in Camden is $23,000, or in some zip codes, it's around $23,000. I can't say for the entire city. In Haddonfield, it's $150,000. Why do you think there's crime in Camden and no crime in Haddonfield? Hmm? Right? What could be the difference between those two? Maybe the $100,000 in income? So you don't have to steal. In Hannafield, if you live in Hannafield and you're making that kind of income, you just use your credit card. You buy what you want. You don't have to steal what you need. But urban poverty creates a lack of dignity despite having stuff. It creates a cycle of poverty, but it also creates a conservative backlash versus these people who ask for help. And you'll see this at the bottom if you're watching my video where Fox News has 99% of people, poor people, quote unquote, have a refrigerator, 81% have a microwave, 48% have a coffee maker, right? And then there's another 96% of a tel television, right? Oh, they can't really be poor, they have stuff. Well, this is the same argument people made in the 1900s, but they have stuff because that stuff is cheap. Do you know what's expensive? Housing. I can buy a TV for a hundred bucks or I can get a TV from a friend who's buying a TV and he has an extra one and he could give that to me, right? So it costs me nothing to get, but my house is going to cost $300,000 to buy or it costs a $1,500 per, per month to rent. Even in Camden, the average rent for a one bedroom apartment in Camden is almost $1,000 a month. It's somewhere around eight seventy nine hundred. I did a presentation on this a couple years ago, so it's probably gone up. But that's $900. That's a mortgage for a house for a middle class family. Like, that's not cheap. The food isn't necessarily cheap, right? 58% have a computer. Well, you can't do school without a computer. So if you have kids, you have to have a computer, right? 65% have a washer and dryer. But there's this lack of dignity in poverty, in urban poverty. You have stuff, but then you have people saying, that stuff means you're not poor. So just work harder. Les Miserables has a song at the end of the day. At the end of the day, you're another day older. And that's all you could say for the life of the poor. It's a struggle. 
It's a war, and there's nothing that anyone's giving. One more, one day, one more day standing about. What is it for? One day less to be living. At the end of the day, you're another day colder, and the shirt on your back doesn't keep out the chill. And the righteous, that's your middle classes, hurry past. They don't hear the little ones crying, and the plague is coming on fast, ready to kill. One day nearer to dying. That's Fantine's company song in Les Mis. She's working, she's working class. She goes from working class to prostitute to dead in four songs. From at the end of the day to I dream the dream, right? Or if you want to include confrontation, right? Is like what? Three to four songs that she goes from working class She's got expenses, it's hard, but she's making it work to dead of tuberculosis because of her poverty. That's, that's reality. So it's always funny to have people in suits and ties making a million dollars on TV talking about who's poor and who's not. (sighs) Pollution. Pollution created a diseased land. All right, you're making all of this stuff. You have a lot of waste to make this stuff. And where, what do they do with it? They just dump it wherever they want. They dump it into the river. They dump it onto the land. They just dump it. There were no rules that forced them because it was so new. So you get a diseased land, and that creates diseased people. And people actually live shorter lives. The crazy thing about industrialization is it actually made life more dangerous for people living in it. London life had a life expectancy of 37 years in 1840. 37 years. This is where in the rural countryside, life expectancy is going up. The city is a terrible place to live. So what we see is the separation of wealth. Psychologically from industry. Psychically, I have. That's NIMBY, not in my backyard. So poor folk live in the worst neighborhood, and poverty kills. Pollution kills, but wealthier folk live in less polluted areas. They escape the city. They go uptown, right, to the Upper East and Upper West Sides. They have a park, right? In London, they go to the West Side because the winds blow west to east. So they go to the West, so they don't have to smell all the pollution in the East. And they get to live longer. Wealthier folk get to live in less polluted areas and allows them to live longer. And guess what this creates? The idea that their lives are better, that they are better than poor people. And it also means they compound more money because they live longer. So if you make $100,000 a year and you live, so, you know, you're 30 and you start to make $100,000 a year, right? And you live to be 80, that's 50 years at $100,000 a year. But if you only live to be 50, that's 20 years. You lose out on 30 more years of income. Every year, $100,000. Every year, $100,000. Every year, $100,000. Every year, $100,000. So what is that? 50, 30 times 100,000 is 3 million, right? That's $3 million. You're poor because you died earlier. So living longer is the best way of getting wealthier. Problems. Crime. It scares the upper classes, the middle classes and the the rich. Notice it's exactly how the news starts, right? I turn on the news, the six o'clock news, and it's these three people were murdered. And there's this building fell down. And uh, and uh, these people were attacked in the middle of the night. And this person was run over. And you're like, oh, my God, when really that doesn't happen at all. It, I mean, it happens, but it in relationship to its 
to the amount of people who live in Philadelphia, it's, it's nothing. It's a drop in the bucket. But it scares upper classes who feel overwhelmed by the sheer enormity of the city, by the sheer mass of people. There's too many people and they're too poor. Now, Rousseau earlier and seriously said the poor should eat the rich. And that's the French Revolution and its guillotines. So they're worried that the poor will overwhelm them. So what do upper upper class people do? Upper middle class, middle class, upper middle class and rich people do? Invent the police. The in police are poor people who are given money, who are given middle class job, middle class incomes in order to beat up on other poor people. The police are invented. Jonathan Swift and Dickens sardonically said the rich should eat the poor. And that's not quite what the rich will do. Jonathan Swift is, uh, and Dickens are both rich, just, you know, in a, in a Christmas Carol, Dickens is like, well, the poor should just die and get rid of this excess, excess population. Well, what they did was they just policed the hell out of them. They kept the poor from expanding. What you also get is social crimes, drugs. Why? Because life sucks. The neighborhood sucks. You don't have a lot of money. And so to feel better, you do drugs. The big drug is opium. Coming from Afghanistan, coming from Northern India. It, you know, opium feels good. How do I know opium feels good? Because half the drugs that they give you when you get an operation are opiates. Because opiates killed more people, have killed, I don't know how many people, as many people as COVID. I don't know. It was the biggest problem in America until COVID happened. People aren't doing it because it feels bad. So opiates make you feel good. That's why they're drugs. That's why people do them. Prostitution, mostly a female poverty. It's mostly women who have children who end up as prostitutes because prostitution is the one job women are able to do. And there's an unending demand for it. But there's male prostitution too. It's not talked about as much. There's not as much historical research into it. It's not as famous. There's no uh, song in Les Mis about it. But it's still there. Especially for non-Europeans. Especially for colonial and exotic men and women. Theft is the most regular urban crime. See the Christmas Carol. The thieves in in the um, Ghost of the Future steal stuff from Ebenezer Scrooge's um, house as he's dying. Like the guy is like, oh, these sheets are still warm. Like whether it's it's a joke or it's not, it tells you that the moment you let your guard down, the thieves will break in. There's no one to protect Ebenezer's stuff. Because he's cut himself off. He was a rich guy. He kept him himself. And so what's going to happen? The moment he dies, thieves are going to get him stuff. The moment he gives up any of his protections, thieves will come. Look at Sherlock Holmes. It's one th crazy theft and, and, and problem after another. All of this is highlighted by the newspaper, which is this gritty realism. It's trying to understand the enormity of the city. This is what's going on in the different neighborhoods. This is who's killed who, who's had affairs with who, who's famous, who's not famous anymore. The Sherlock Holmes novels is the, is the ability of trying to understand, to use reason to go against evil passion. So the idea that, that crime is, is the, they're, they're the murderers, um, Jack the Ripper, these are evil, and how do you, how can you get, how can you understand them? And here's Sherlock Holmes being like, ah, oh, I can use logic and reason and a hell of a lot of opium, by the way, to shut down his brain in order to understand evil, that you can understand evil, that evil isn't the devil. There's a logic to evil. That's what the Sherlock Holmes novels are trying to show you. Meanwhile, the newspaper is trying to show you 
this enormous city of 5 million people of London or of New York and trying to in 50 pages in 150 news stories tell you what's going on. What do you need to know for that day? And then the newspaper comes out the next day and then the next day and then the next day because that's how much the city is changing. A major problem, and we're going to see this in Dickens, so this section is really on Charles Dickens, is that money is replacing Christ and it's hardening the souls to others. And you've seen me kind of mention this in my attitude. You see my analysis of this stuff. There's an analysis where you can go, F all these people. They should have just worked better. Lazy ingrates. That's Ebenezer Scrooge. My attitude is a more liberal, social, democratic approach. Uh, I'm a Scandinavian historian, man. What do you think my economic ideas are? You know, where do you think I come down? I'm a, I'm a community college professor. I come, you know, I'm okay with the, the lefty wing of my party. Because I, I'm also a Catholic. And Dickens is seeing Dickens is... I think he's a Protestant, but he's, he's seen that money is replacing Christ. See, when everyone's poor, there's a humility in it. There's a, well, at least everybody's poor, right? There's the one rich dude out in Downton Abbey up on the hill, but everybody else is more or less the same, right? And so when someone has problems, we can all pitch in. What Dickens has seen in London is that money is separating people. Look at us from Camden. And we're going to have a whole section on this in our in part three of our class. But look at this. Camden to Collingswood. We're, we're just going to do five miles of South Jersey, of Haddon Avenue. We go from Camden, one of the poorest cities in the Northeast, to Collingswood, to Haddon Township, Westmont, to Haddon Field, one of the richest towns in the Northeast, in five miles. You can't run from one end of it to the other and back and still do a marathon. That's how close. And yet all of those people live completely different lives. The life of their children are completely different. The lives of their grandchildren, where they vacation, what they eat, what they do for fun is different. They're in different universes. Those four towns are essentially in different universes. Why? Because of money. And that's what Dickens is seeing. And so he starts to write these novels, and they're the industrial novel. They are not only industrialized, they're printed in newspapers, they're mass produced, right, by printing presses, but they're about industry. They're about the social themes, urban lives, realism, but also the hope. People are read people who are reading Dickens are middle classes, and they need hope that the system and that the poor will be okay, that the system isn't bad because they know they have privilege. They know they've won or are winning. I mean, that's the Christmas Carol. The Christmas Carol is a dude who doesn't know he's won at money, learning that he's won at money. So morality matters in Dickens. It's your values. It's your convictions. It's your, it's your Christianity. It's Cratchit who is not poor, but he's working class. He is not in poverty, but he doesn't have any liquid money. He's got a house. His daughters, his son, right, have clothes on their back. They have a feast. They have a Christmas meal. It's not large, but they have it. They have a roof over their heads. And so Cratchit, Mr. Scrooge, said Bob. I'll give you Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. To which Mrs. Cratchit is like, WTF there, honey. The founder of the feast indeed, said, cried Mrs. Cratchit, reddening. I wish I had him here. I give him a piece of my mind to feast upon, and I hope he'd have a good appetite for it, because I am going to shovel it right down his throat. That's me adding that in brackets. And she has every right 
Let's not be all like Bob Cratchit and he's got a wife. His wife has every right. She has two daughters. She's got to marry. She's got to get into something better than they have, right? She's got a sick son who is dying because they can't get the medicine or they can't afford more medicine. She has every right to look at Cratchit's boss and go, he has so much and he won't share it. My daughters are going to end up worse. My son may die. And he, he, he can't share a little bit of coal so that my husband works a little bit more comfortably? F him. She has every right. But this is the morality part. This is the values and convictions. Cratchit is still Christian about it. He's still like, he still pays me. He still gives me a job. I buy what I can buy because of this guy. So I give you Mr. Scrooge. Which leads us to lesson two from Dickens. I, I'm going to use a curse word, but it's don't be a dick. Just don't be a dick. Be a good manager of people. Be nice. Be Christian. Be, that, that's what Christianity is. Christianity is simply don't be a dick. Money isn't Christian. And there's the famous scene in Christmas Carol between Scrooge and Fozziewig. It's a reminder to the middle classes as well as the rich. That money doesn't make you moral. Money doesn't make you better. Money doesn't make you nicer. Money's just money. So here they are. The ghosts of the past has taken Scrooge to see Fozziewig and the party, the Christmas party Fozziewig is giving and everybody's happy and they're cheering Fozziewig and they're all great and Animal is on drums and things are wonderful and everyone is having a good time and the ghost goes, a small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small, echoed Scrooge. Why is it not? He has spent a, but a few pounds of your mortal money. Three or four. It's nothing. Nothing. Perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? And Scrooge responds, It isn't that. Said Scrooge, heated by the remark, and speaking like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that, spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light of burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. This is Scrooge, who literally will not pay a penny for things, pay an extra penny, saying, Fozzie spends three or four pounds, and it makes all the difference. It's a reminder to tip your waitresses, because they work harder than you. It's a reminder to be kind to the cashiers at Wegmans because they work hard. It's be nice. Be a good manager. Think about other people. That it's not about the money. It's about your soul. Money doesn't make you a better person. It just reveals who you are. And Dickens is saying, don't be a dick. In other works, in Great Expectations, it's pull yourself up, work, and luck will equal success. But it doesn't equal happiness. Happiness you create yourself, regardless of your wealth or position. That's the thing about Scrooge, is he has all of this money and he's miserable. He's a miserable person. He's alone. He has no love. Compare him in the beginning of the story, before he runs into Scrooge. 
not Scrooge, Marley, the Marley brothers, to the end where he's buying the golden goose, the Christmas goose, the biggest goose in all the shops. You create your own happiness. In Great Expectations, the young man gets everything. He gets, gets everything he wanted and he's not happy. So the idea is pull yourself up, but also remain who you are. Become happy. Fi success. Money isn't happiness. And happiness, in a very Buddhist sense, is the goal of life. Stay human. Industrialization will rob you of it. That's the book Hard Times. Then it makes you soulless. This, stay human, industrialization will rob you of your humanity, is the Amazon warehouse is every story you hear coming out of the Amazon warehouse where they don't get bathroom breaks or their bathroom breaks are such a limited amount of time and the, the factory is so big, the warehouse is so big that you can't do anything, especially if you have uh, mobility issues. It's, but everything that in, is, everything in Amazon is industrialized. Is computerized, is monitored, is digitized, is, 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 is. And humans aren't built for that. The Amazon warehouse will work much better once they get rid of people, which will be bad for people's income, but will be much better for people, for humanity. The Amazon warehouse does not really want people in it. They slow everything down. They screw things up. This is what um, Elon Musk tried to do with Tesla. He tried to make uh, the Tesla cars as automated as possible. And it turned out he made a worse car. They had to rip out all the guts. So back before Tesla was worth more than all the other car companies, Tesla made terrible cars. Cool looking cars, but terrible because they ripped out the guts of all the, of the, their major factory out in California. Because he had automated everything and it didn't work. It needed people in it. But the problem is people are inefficient. Well, that's stay human. Dickens is saying to his middle class audience, that's okay. It's okay that people show up late. It's okay they leave early. It's okay that their mother is sick. It's okay their pet died. It's okay. Capitalism doesn't give a shit about any of that stuff. It doesn't care about your humanity. Just read Moby Dick for that. Moby Dick is the great industrialized workbook. I'm doing Dickens. We could easily do it with Moby Dick. About just how industrialized and lacking humanity the whaling ship is. And Dickens is trying to remind his audience, stay human. So responses to industrialization. The first and most important <coughs> is communism. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels will write Capital, the Communist Manifesto. This is a revolutionary liberal idea. This is not conservative. This is liberal. Workers need to own their own capital and business. Why is it revolutionary? Because they need to overthrow the system. Why is it liberal? Because it wants change right now. Workers need to own the capital. They need to own the business. In capitalism, the owners of capital, the investors or entrepreneurs, are privileged. They make the profits and face less taxes. The advantage is wealthy people invest into economic activity. The disadvantage is workers are paid as little as possible to maximize profits. See, wages are the only thing that's negotiable. Wages, not resources, are a flexible cost, right? I can, so someone wants to work for, I make uh, 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 plastic spoons, right? I have to buy the plastic from somewhere. I have to buy the machine for the mold. I have to buy the mold. I have to buy the machine to press the mold. Then I have to buy the cardboard to put the plastic spoons into, right? And then I have to buy a, a truck and fill it with gas in order to ship it. I can't negotiate 
any of that. I can't go to the plastic suppliers and go, uh, how about you uh, give me uh, just an extra special price because I'm a nice guy. I'm going to say no. They're going to say, if you buy a ton more, we could, we could knock a couple pennies off because you're buying in bulk up front. So you're buying wholesale. <coughs> and I say, but I can't afford that. And they say, tough. The, the car is, the truck is going to cost what it, what it costs. The gas is going to cost what it costs. The cardboard has to be bought from somewhere. Like the only thing I can negotiate around is the dude who walks and goes, hi, I'd like to have a job. And I go, great, I'll pay you 10 bucks an hour. And he goes, great, I really wanted $22 an hour. And I go, that's awesome. 10 bucks an hour. Okay, but I have a sick mom and my little brother doesn't have a leg. And uh, I'm also going to college trying to like be awesome. And I'm like, that's awesome. $9.50. Oh, wait, wait, that's a little less than you were just offering. Well, you're taking up my time. Time is money, son. Oh, don't call me son. That's not really appropriate in this day and age. Well, okay. nine twenty-five an hour. Oh, I'll take it. Right? I can negotiate the wage. I can't negotiate any of my other costs. So the only place I can save money is by paying workers less. Or paying less workers by firing people. So capitalism requires poverty or slavery of workers so that the owners of capital can make as much profit as possible to reinvest in economic activity. Capitalism would love there to be a small group of owners and a large group of slaves. Capitalism loved the American South, the plantation South. That is a capitalism on fire. Capitalism is not evil. Capitalism is not good. It is amoral. But it allows its demands, its incentives are anti-human. It just is. Why? Because it's about the money. It's in the name. It's not humanism. It's capitalism. The problem for Marx and Engels is the government needs money and thus can be influenced by the wealthy caste, the wealthy people. So you get an alliance between the top 1% and government. We see this in the homestead strike in 1892, the railroad strike in 1877, where the government called out the army, called out the state militia to shoot strikers and allow the factories to get back to work. So Marx's solution is communism. Workers must unite, overthrow the government, redistribute ownership. This is the French Revolution style, right? You take a hundred, you take a 10,000 acre farm and give... Uh, people, uh, you give you give them a hundred acres each. Boom, 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 boom. So that all citizens are owners in the means of production, so that everyone shares. This is also gender and racial equality. Everyone's part of this. The overwhelming sentence that comes out of Marx is the idea, and I don't think it's from Marx himself. It's probably pre-Marx, but it's from each according to his ability. So from you, what you can give and to each what one needs. <clears throat> now, communism is not new. Nomads that we talked about in History 101, the early Christian church. Also, it's how we treat old folks. It's how we treat children. It's how Alaska treats oil payments. They give money. They give profits. They divide it up and give it to all the citizens of Alaska. It's how we live in potluck parties. Have you, you ever gone to a church potluck? That's communism. So for people who are like, dude, communism can never work. It's like, I have never been to a potluck dinner at a, at a church that wasn't fun. That wasn't a whole host that no, that people brought and they didn't bring anything. They said, well, I'm going to get plenty of food. And uh, so I'm not going to make anything because that would be expensive for me. And I can get plenty of food at the potluck. No, everybody brought something. That's how we use the national parks. And those of you who live in South Jersey and Philly, you could walk you could take the Paco and go and go to the Constitution Center. Now, what Marx didn't see, Marx is demanding a revolution. What he didn't see was capitalism reforming, government helping workers, labor unions, the Labor Party, and workers accepting as little as they're willing to accept. 
rather than the whole. And that's the white collar middle class. The white collar middle class allows Jeff Bezos to be worth $100 billion as long as they get paid $100,000 a year. And Marx didn't anticipate that. Marx said, well, you could take that $100 billion and distribute it to everybody and live much better. And white collar, the white collar middle class said, no, I want my $100,000. As long as I get that, he can do what he wants. That's modern capitalism. We're going to talk about that when we hit part three. The second response to industrialization is romanticism. We see this in the poetry of Wordsworth and Coleridge, the, the novels of Alcott and Thoreau. The countryside is better. The small town, the nature, the traditions, the feelings. Look at the pictures. It's Wordsworth Lake District. Dude, that's better than London too. How do I know? Because people in London go to vacation in the Lake District. And they sit there and they look at the lakes and they look at the mountains and they look at the little green and go, I wish I could live here. Everybody does it. I've done it because it's beautiful. If you were Wordsworth sitting there with a pen and a piece of paper, you'd write about how great the countryside is too. In Pride and Prejudice. Mr. Darcy, may I see you to the village? No, says Lizzie. I'm very fond of walking. He's like, yes, yes, I, I know. You are very fond of walking. Lizzie loves walking through the countryside. It's better than the city. Why? Because the city is industry. It's smoke. It's pollution. It's noise. It's crime. It's violence. It is literally bad for you. Right? As the as the the thing said before, um the the advice on graduation was live in New York once but leave before it makes you hard, and live in San Francisco once, but leave before it makes you soft. Right? Cities are bad for you. Sire uh, Sir, Cyrus. Cyrus, King Cyrus of Persia says that when the Persians are like, we conquered the world, can we live in cities now? Cyrus is like, no, Cyrus, will, cities will make you soft. You settle down, you get decadent. But romanticism is people need to return to nature, a slower life, more personal connections. Thoreau just built a shack on a lake and then wrote a book on it. Walden. You know, it's the idea that you have to get away from the city. You have to get away from industrialization, that it's not normal. It's not healthy. Wordsworth and Coleridge are rich dudes who would not agree with Marx on most of the economic stuff Marx is talking about, but they would all agree that capitalism is bad for people. And finally, you get liberalism in the poverty in the social crush of what is industrialization, you get liberalism. The idea that change is necessary, change is good. And this is seen very starkly with John Stewart and especially his wife, Harriet Stewart Mill. Now I bring both of them up because John Stewart was smart enough, John Stewart Mill was smart enough to marry a woman smarter than him. And he then realized that because of sexism, most of her talents were wasted. And so his book on liberty, which is the founding book of liberalism, is the idea that people are being wasted by the system. His wife should be awesome, and she's not allowed to be awesome. Why? Because she doesn't have the right reproductive organs on the outside of her body. She has the wrong ones inside of her body. Government regulations can help this. But ultimately, the system can't continue. It's making people's lives worse. It's unchristian. It's uncivilized. It's unequal. It's immoral. It's not modern. There is always in liberalism an argument that, mo that modernity demands equality. That inequality is in the past. Shouldn't we move towards equality and a better life? From this liberalism, you get the Labor Party, L-A-B-O-U-R. You get American progressives. You get feminism. The idea to use government power and democracy 
to make people's lives better, to change the system, not to revolt the system like Marx wants. Marx wants a revolution against the system. That's not what liberalism is talking about. It's talking about changing the system to improve it, but keeping the system. It's changing it from the inside. So free education, free health care, pensions, government agencies, more voting, more democracy. One of the big things of the Labor Party and American progressives and feminism is more democracy. More people should be able to participate because if more people can participate in democracy, the government has to listen to them. We get food and drug regulations to improve health, help the poor. We get the national parks to return to nature. That's romanticism, right? Go to go to Glacier National Park, go to Yellowstone, go that here are places that industry, that capitalism isn't allowed. It's to get away from the city, but it's also taking a piece of the world and saying capitalism doesn't work here. Now, why would conservatives agree to this? Why would they not fight it to the end? Why would they not reject it? Because it's change a little or the French Revolution, change a little or revolution. And people in the 19th century know the French Revolution, the cutting off of people's heads. You know, if you're a French aristocrat in 1850, you likely had a grandpa who lost their head. So it's in your mind. And then the revolutions of 1848 reminded everybody, holy shit, if we don't get better at this, we're going to be overwhelmed by the poor. So it's change a little or change a lot. You pick conservatives and conservatives said, we'll change a little because at least then we have a say in what changes. And so you get the income tax, election of senators and labor union protections, a limit on the workday, right? It goes from 16 hours to eventually eight hours. Income, the middle, the, the minimum wage, these kind of things all came in and conservatives kept them. If they, if conservatives didn't bring them in, conservatives kept them. Why? Because the French revolution and the revolutions of 1848 said, if you don't change, you will be destroyed. You'll get communism. You'll get Marx. And Marx is out there being like, overthrow the entire system. The, the entire system is rotted like a tree all the way through. And so that's industrialization. That's capitalism. That's liberalism. That's Fozzie wig. That's feminism. We talked about a lot of stuff. That's people's lives getting better and worse at the same time. That's pollution. That's crime. That's law and order. We talked about a lot of stuff. So thank you. Take care.